thanks for joining me for the, the final session of today. I hope it was already a very productive day of uh, second bit for you. So I'm going to put on my speaker head right now. So I'm going to talk about web security, um, not about organizing the course. So this talk is about the security model of the web. Um, and essentially what I want to cover here is a few, uh, I'm going to start out with a few basics. So uh, don't drift off yet if it's stuff you know, because I'm going to go into a, a few uh, concrete attacks as well. I'm going to go into um, how countermeasures work and why countermeasures depend on this very basic security policy that we have in the web and why it's so important. This is something that will come back um, in my sessions later this week. It will come back in gym sessions later this week because it's um, a very essential mechanism in the web to keep things uh, private and to ensure security um, for as much as possible we have in a web context. So let me start with the concept of an origin. This is the most important concept within a browser and an origin essentially means um, a sort of identifier for a certain context. So if you have a URL um, in a browser, this is a very complete representation. The only thing missing, I think, is a username and a password, which takes us a bit too far. But you have all of these different parts. So you have essentially a scheme, which is HTTP or HTTPS or uh, FTP or whatever. Um, you have a host, a port, which is very often implicit. So uh, most of the time you don't see the port, which is 80 or 443. You have a path, a specific file. And you also have some parameters in the query part, and you have a fragment which is um, kept on the browser and never sent to the server. So from all of these things, um, an origin is essentially these three parts. So an origin is a triple of the scheme, the host, and a port of a specific URL. And that's where the origin comes from, and that's uh, what's used to identify a certain context. And this already matters in the most basic security policy of the web, the same origin policy. And the same origin policy has been in browsers for about 20 years. And this is uh, very essential, very important, and it was first introduced um, when JavaScript came around, and when web pages became dynamic and we, when we needed to protect them against uh, certain malicious behavior. So the same origin policy says if you have two contexts and they have the same origin, they can interact with each other. If they have different origins, they cannot interact with each other. So a, few, a very simple example, we have uh, a page with uh, a frame in it, um, and they both have this URL meaning that they both have the same origin. It's HTTP, it's the same host, and it's the same implicit port. So they can freely interact with each other. They can inspect each other's DOM. They can um, basically do whatever they want. If you have an origin protected resource, like storage in the browser, most modern browsers have a storage facility which you can easily access. Um, both of them share the same one because it's based on an origin. So this one is associated with this origin. They have the same origin, so they both have access to this <coughs> store. Change the example to a subdomain, so you have forum.example.com and private.example.com. These are no longer the same origin because the host is a different, even though the scheme and the port are. So this means that they cannot freely interact anymore. This also means if this one has a data store associated with its origin, that this origin will not be able to access the data store. It will be, accessed, it will be able to access its own data store, which uh, is associated with its own origin, but not this very specific one associated with private.example.com. This is a very basic fundamental security policy that is actually more important than you might imagine on the web today. Already a few examples of uh, resources that are protected by the same origin policy, these origin protected resources. So we have the DOM, you have the page and the contents. You have these storage facilities. You have local storage, but you have plenty of uh, other ones as well. You have permissions. If you grant a website permission to access your webcam, for example, you actually grant permission not to Facebook, but to the origin, HTTPS, Facebook.com, and port 443. That's very, very important. Um, this holds for other features like geolocation, media capture, uh, things like that. Inspecting resources from a server, fetching a resource and actually processing it in script um, is also associated with an origin. And you can do it if it's your own origin, but it becomes a lot more difficult uh, or you need special policies if you want to do that from uh, other origins. And the same is for sending XHR requests. And all of this, essentially brings you to the conclusion that, that you actually want to be in control of what happens in your origin. If you have code running around in your origin doing whatever it wants, you're in a lot of trouble because it can access a whole lot of stuff which is actually private to your application. So that's um, the main topic of this talk here today. So like I said, why is this important? Well, first of all, this is the basic security model of the web and if you don't really grasp what this means, it's gonna be very hard to understand things like defenses against cross-site request forgery because they build on top of this same origin policy. Next, um, web security is very important at SecUpDev. Um, we have uh, a couple of sessions on web security. These things, this concept will come back in these sessions as well. So that's definitely another reason to um, pay attention during this session. 
And um, in my opinion, a lot of security problems are actually caused by a lack of knowledge. And this is not, um, um, this is not a, well, I don't know how to, how to say it. It's not a fault of a developer per se, but um, it comes down to the fact if you don't know about a security problem, if you don't know how to fix the security problem, then it will not be fixed in your code. If you never heard of something like cross-site request for a tree, chances are you've never implemented a defense against it as well. And it means that your application might be vulnerable. So before I go on with the rest of my talk, um, a few words about me. I strongly believe in spreading this knowledge, which is why I give um, talks on, on conferences like this, on our conferences, but I also give training courses uh, purely on web security. Um, we also do um, threat assessments of existing applications um, to see um, what companies are doing with security and how they can improve that even further. Um, I did a PhD on client-side on, on client web security mainly, and during my PhD I also wrote a book um, which is titled The Primer on Client-Side Web Security, um, which gives a very nice overview of the landscape um, and best practices that, that you should be applying there. So, if there are any questions, by the way, uh, during my talk, feel free to interrupt. Um, you can go into a discussion. Um, I'm sure Jim will have some uh, nice additions here and there um, if he is trying to stay awake, or managing to stay awake, at least. <laughs> so, let's start with browsing contexts. Not the most sexy topic, but um, I have three slides I need to get through before I get to the interesting stuff. So what is a browsing context? Well, if you have a web page, like the second of web page, essentially a browsing context might be this. So it's uh, the context where a page is loaded. Browsing contexts come in, in various flavors. So um, let's say that the second of web page would open a pop-up, which it doesn't, but let's say it does. Um, in this pop-up, you also have a browsing context. So this is called an auxiliary, auxiliary browsing context, and it's essentially a context that lives somewhere else. But there's this kind of relationship between the both. So you, between both, you have this. This would be the parent, and this would be the child. So um, there's some relationship, and it has certain uh, certain impact uh, security-wise, which I'm going to go into in a bit. We also have nested browsing context. This is, for example, from the second left page. This is actually a real-life example. Um, the program is running on SCAD. Um, it's integrated with an iframe. So these, these are two different browsing contexts, and they're nested. If they have the same origin, they can interact with each other. This is the image from before. If they have a different origin, like here, uh, like is the case here, they will not be able to interact with each other. And that's um, what, it's, what it's really about here. Um, and that's also where security problems will arise. So, to you, um, this is uh, an example of their sort of frame demo. A question I have here for you um, is here, um, <clears throat> what can you actually tell about origin? So we have the, the, the top browsing context and we have different frames. Do you know which context has well, uh, which origin? Can you derive this somehow? View source. Yeah, view source, okay. Um, you teach your mother to do view source if you <laughs> She's entering stuff somewhere online. Yeah? <laughs> awesome. Should bring your mother along tomorrow. <laughs> She'll fit right in. No, really. Can you derive anything from this? Well, you have a URL here, but you're not even sure that the context you see here actually belongs to that origin uh, that's shown there. So we have the, the top um, context and you have all of these subcontexts. And this is exactly the problem. All of this is very implicit. The browser knows it. The browser enforces restrictions on it, but we cannot really see it. And that's where things become um, very tricky very quickly. So one of the consequences of having these different contexts is um, interaction between both. So the top one actually runs on example.com, which is simply a name for my, uh, for my machine um, for this demo. This yellow context also runs on example.com, meaning if I do something like this, so if I get a frame, get the window, access the document, and set some inner HTML in the body, which is not the right way to do this, but uh, serves uh, quite good for a demo, um, this same origin value actually appears here, because these two can inspect each other's DOM. They have free access to everything, meaning that if there's some secret information shown on the page here, the other page will be able to fetch it, uh, will be able to inspect it and modify it. The second frame um, runs on um, something entirely else, private.example.com. If you try to access that the same way, the browser will say, no, 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 that's not allowed, because you're uh, running in different origins, uh, no interaction for you. Okay, so even if you're isolated, let's say the red frame um, is, is happy, it's protected from the other frame, um, what else can go wrong? So um, another example of, of uh, 
potential application. This is a made up application, especially for Jim, because I remember from two years ago that he really loves stroke waffles. <laughs> so, question to you, would you like some stroke waffles to your home? Which button would you choose? Hell yeah. Hell yeah, of course. But what you don't see is that, in fact, this is, uh, this is called the UI redressing attack. And instead of uh, clicking the hell yeah button on the stroke waffles page, you're clicking this in, a, in an iframe. This iframe is made uh, transparent, or is actually reduced here to this very small viewport. And all you see is the button, which is actually sitting in this larger page. And this is uh, a very sneaky attack where you actually redress the UI around a very specific element of uh, a victim page and you get the user to click here. And the user's click will actually go to this button, um, banning all kitty pictures from the web, which is not a good thing, as you will all uh, realize. So this is something that a user never, will never be able to catch. A second example of how an attack can happen in, in a context like this, we have the same application here. Instead of um, this button belonging to another uh, page, we actually overlay a transparent page right on top of that. So we have this page, we make it transparent, and we position it right um, here so that those two buttons line up. The only problem is this button is transparent. The bottom page can look like whatever it wants. It can be a game tricking you to click on, on a certain animal, which uh, gives the attacker certain guarantees that you will click at that very specific location. And you will put a frame there so that instead of here, you click on this button, hell yeah. Could be the button to delete your Twitter profile, could be just about anything. And that's a very, very dangerous attack as well. This is called click checking, by the way, because you're stealing clicks from the user and you're making sure they end up somewhere else without the user realizing what's happening. There's actually very little you can do against these things. The only effective countermeasure is trying to restrict framing, because this uh, depends on the fact that this uh, page lives inside a frame. So by, by preventing framing, restricting framing, you can tell the browser, please don't frame me unless I explicitly give you approval to frame me in this context. This used to be done with JavaScript code. So uh, back in the day, you used to write JavaScript code to, to uh, frame busting code, which uh, it was called. And it was um, code and inspected the, or, uh, the URL of the top frame. And if it didn't match um, the current frame, it would try to break out and reload in the top frame and things like that. Yes. People have researched this and people have broken this uh, over and over again. So that's not the right way to do it. The best practice today is to actually whitelist origins that are allowed to frame you, um, which can be either none, yourself, or uh, very specific origins as well. See this origin already coming back um, to this very specific security measure. One way to do this is with the X-Frame Options header. This is a header you can send from the server to the browser, and it, this tells the browser that either you want uh, framing to be denied, sure, you can send it to same origin, meaning that um, only your own pages are, are able or allowed to create frames of your uh, application and other origins will not be able to do so. Or you can use allow from. And allow from um, can be used to set a very specific origin in the whitelist to allow framing. Problem is not all browsers support this, so you should, if you want to use this feature, you should actually combine this with another feature, which is the frame ancestors directive from content security policy. Small word, content security policy is um, a behemoth of a security policy. It contains way too many features to be healthy, um, but it's um, something that's a lot used a lot today to enforce certain security uh, mechanisms. And one of these is frame ancestors, where you have the same uh, kind of ideas you have here. You have self, which is the same origin. You have none, which is nobody. And you have um, either a list of allowed origins, which you can use to um, allow framing by certain origins. In practice, it looks like this. The X-Frame Options header is something like this. So it's either the very specific keyword to deny or uh, same origin, or you have this allow from with one host. Problem is, you can only list one host here. So you have to make this, uh, if you want to allow multiple hosts to frame you, you, make, you have to make this dynamic. In content security policy, it looks like this. You have the frame ancestors, and you have this uh, host that is allowed, or you can either specify none if you don't want anybody to frame you. For browser support. Could you go back? Sorry. Yeah. So, so at, the, at the bottom, your frame ancestors, that, that's, the, that's basically allowed from the content security policy. Yes. Do you have research that shows which browser supports which at this point? Yes. You talk about offline. 
Here. Um, so X-Frame options. <laughs> the, the, the dark green ones are fully supported. The light green ones are, are partially supported. And that's only the deny and same origin. So the allow from is not supported in basically WebKit and Blink. That's what it comes down to. Um, and for CSP, um, it's, it's a bit uh, different. So Frame Ancestors is part of CSP level two. So WebKit and Blink supports that uh, very well. Edge is uh, coming along uh, and Firefox has a few, few issues that are not yet implemented, but I'm not sure which ones. But I think Frame Ancestors is fine. Just respond to both or should I detect, <coughs> detect which you weigh and make a tactical choice or just dump both? Well, um, my advice is if you if the policy is not too complex, um, you can do both. Um, if you need to start um, detect, if you need to have an explicit list of hosts that are allowed, then it's, it's already a mess with X-Frame options because it only supports one host. So, um, or Allow one from supports one host only? One origin only, yes. So you already need to detect where is it coming from and do I allow that one and then echo it back. Um, can, I, can I say one, can I do multiple headers with one in each one? Or do you, they only accept the first? That, that I'm not sure. I, I got you. I would have to look it up. I, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. So. This is only the beginning. Um, we had the same origin policy, but even without breaking that or with that in place, um, there are still some attacks that are possible on your web page. Um, and the only thing you can do is prevent the frame. I talked about this pop-up, this auxiliary browsing context. That's another example of um, one of the nasty features of the web. Um, I have a GIF to illustrate this. This is from, from a GitHub project. So essentially, this is a page on GitHub. Um, somebody clicks on the link. And um, what actually happens um, in this open tabs is all of a sudden he's logged out of GitHub. So um, that seems to be uh, not very dangerous. But what actually happens here is if you look at this, this is uh, not the main GitHub page. This is simply a subdomain of GitHub under the user's control. So what actually happens is that once you click this link, uh, a pop-up opens, well, a new page opens, which is in a new tab, which is the default behavior. And while, um, while that happens, so the tab that opened um, actually um, has a reference to the page that triggered it to open. So it can reach back to the original page and then start um, modifying that page if it lives within the same origin. That's, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, that's another strange problem to have, but it's uh, unfortunately uh, the, way how the, the way the web works. So what's happening here is um, you have an opener. So if I have a link here and I say target blank, this will open in a new tab but the new tab will have a reference back to my original window where this link lives. And if it's same origin, they can start inspecting each other. And uh, that's definitely, um, definitely a problem. So what you can do is you can specify this no opener um, attribute, and that actually tells the browser to cut the window loose, to don't, uh, don't keep a reference to the window that opened it, and that actually helps preventing potential abuse. Um, this is a very strange thing that um, not too many people seem to worry about, but there are some practical attacks against this kind of scenario um, available. Browser support for this is uh, fairly limited. It's fairly new. Um, there is some, uh, some older option, which is called no referrer, um, that actually um, also prevents the sending of a referrer header, which is a bit more strict. Um, so you can also, also use that. A workaround is actually opening it through JavaScript. First, um, removing the opener and then loading the new, um, new URL can also uh, achieve the same result. But it's, a bit more complicated. So browser support um, from this very useful Can I Use website, um, it's basically Chrome and Opera that support it and other browsers um, come a bit later. Is there, is there a very good use case why you would want that, to not want to use this? I mean, um, I just don't see why. Yeah, I, I think it actually came from back when you, people actually used pop-ups for dialogues and stuff like that. Then you might want to uh, communicate with the main page, but now with, with tab browsing and things like that, um, it's a lot less useful. Yeah, it's an historic thing that um, they simply don't want to take out because a lot of people probably depend on it for some weird uh, scenario, and they would break if they took it out. So that's why. Uh, most of these security features are patchwork on top of patchwork. So it's like, oh, we have a problem here. Let's add some stuff here and a bit there. And that's unfortunately how this grows. Um, it's going to get worse uh, if you're worried about patchwork. <coughs> OK, 
So let's talk about this browsing context and what we can actually um, do to, um, to restrict what's running in this context. So let's flip the tables. We're the host page and we want to load something in a frame, but we maybe don't want to give it full access. Uh, maybe we want to restrict what's happening there. That's also um, something that's definitely possible um, on the web here. So by default, if um, the SecAbdev page would load a frame from SecAbdev, that frame has all the power that the main page has. As long as it's the same origin, it can do, um, it can even access the main page and start uh, changing things there. It can access the same data, it can access the same permissions, and maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want a, a context where we can run something in a bit of restricted mode. And that's exactly um, what the sandbox attribute has to offer. So if you have an iframe, you can um, apply a sandbox to it, and the sandbox will definitely, uh, or will essentially put a set of restrictions on the frame. So meaning, um, very concretely, if you load an iframe with a sandbox, you get a separate unique origin, meaning that your frame all of a sudden is no longer the same origin. It becomes something unique that will never ever match any other origin in the browser. So this frame will be isolated from every other context in your page or browser. But you also get the benefit of no script execution. So if there's malicious script in there, it will not be executed. Nobody will be able to submit forms in a frame. You uh, do not get to make pop-ups. There's no plugin content like Flash or Java. There's no full screen features, no autoplay, uh, so you get the picture. This is a very restrictive context that allows you to load uh, a part of your application or uh, maybe an untrusted part of your application in a way that will not harm you too much. Of course, this is uh, very restricted and maybe not very useful. So you can actually start uh, to configure the sandbox to uh, re-enable certain features. So by default, the sandbox is applied. Then you can start saying, okay, but I, I still want all the benefits, like a unique origin, but I also want to be able to run some scripts in there. Sure, you can re-enable that. You can re-enable all features except for plugin content and uh, arbitrary navigation. So um, you can re-enable navigation for the top-level context, for example, but not for, um, for just any context on the page. Fair word of warning, if you start re-enabling features, don't ever re-enable allow scripts and allow same origin. Um, because obviously if you do that, then you get the same origin page where scripts can run and a malicious script can simply reach out into the, to the host page, uh, remove the sandbox and uh, break out, out of the iframe altogether. So um, this is a very important warning, it's in the spec, um, but if you don't happen to read the spec and come across this feature, be aware that you shouldn't be using them together. Yes? I, I worry about two things about this. Mm -hmm. It's rarely practical in development and IE jokes about this, IE doesn't support it. Really? Yeah. Because this website says it does. It's wrong. We're okay. Flat out, we're flat out wrong. And what explicitly doesn't doesn't work? Do you know? I, 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 can, t I, can, I can take it offline, but uh, certain aspects of okay. configuring the policy is, is a bit off. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, we should inform them I'll, that they, they make this light green. And, uh, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take it offline. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll dump some slides here to take it offline. Okay, and, sure. And, and, and independent of support issue, the, the level of granularity for uh, the iframe sandboxing, I don't find that practical in development. So few people use it because of that, the lack of configuration. Yeah, it, it depends on, on how you want to use it though. Um, because it becomes really practical if you use it in combination with SRC doc, um, which is my next point. So a sandbox- which is, which is the part that IE won't support. Okay, yeah. yeah. In that case, um, I don't, I don't mean to short circuit what you're saying. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Who cares about IE anyway? So. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so a sandbox becomes really useful or uh, practical if you use it in combination with SRC doc. And SRC doc is actually a mechanism to specify some HTML um, to quickly load the iframe. And this seems like a weird construction, giving HTML to an iframe to include it there. But one of the potential use cases is, for example, if you have a page like a blog and you have comments on there. These comments are provided by a user. This is a prime attack factor for cross-site scripting, for example. Somebody may inject a script there and uh, would compromise their blog if you render that um, on the page. So with SRC doc, you can uh, load each, and what, uh, each of these comments in an iframe without having to go back to the server, fetch a page, uh, get it to the browser, parse it, and then load it into the iframe. So you can specify a very short snippet of HTML here, apply the sandbox on there, meaning that the comment will not uh, be able to run in an environment with script execution, will not be able to uh, will run in a unique origin, uh, will not be able to create forms or submit uh, forms or whatever. <coughs> so that's actually um, one of the useful scenarios to apply the sandbox to. It's a lightweight mechanism to get a constrained environment. 
as our CDOC, if it's not supported, um, I don't have a support. Um, can I use a screenshot for this, actually? I maybe should add it in, in a future version of the slide deck. Um, if it's not supported, the browser will fall back to the simple SRC uh, argument. If it, if it is supported and specified, the browser will um, use that instead of the, the HTML page that's specified here. So this saves you a lot of uh, performance if you want to load uh, a couple of these in a uh, sandbox iframe. So we have this iframe. Um, how can we communicate with that? And what's uh, relevant there? Well. Um, it used to be very difficult to communicate with, with a context in an iframe, especially if it wasn't same origin, and there wasn't a real design way to, to send a message to this iframe, for example. Of course, if there isn't a by design way, people find a way to do it anyway. Um, that's also a reason why the web is uh, sometimes very insecure. In this case, they discovered that this URI fragment, this part that's never sent to the server, that you can actually send a message in there. So you can simply change the URL of the iframe, put a message in this uh, fragment, and the iframe can monitor the fragment until it changes, and then it can uh, extract the message and do something with that. You can imagine this is not a very good way to do it. It was a very hacky solution uh, with a limited uh, size to send messages, but it worked for uh, some time. That's the moment that um, people building browsers and, and specs said like, okay, if people are doing this, then maybe we should start providing a mechanism to do it by design, and that's the web messaging API. So the web messaging API, um, in a nutshell, it's this uh, function post message, where you can give a message or an object that should be shared or whatever. Uh, you can pass something on to a different context, and you have to specify where you want to send it to. And that's, that's essentially it. Um, if you look carefully where you want to send it to, this is an origin. This is where this concept is, is coming back. So you have to tell the browser, I'm going to send this message to a context, to this frame, and I believe it to be from this origin. And the reason you need to do that is if somebody, uh, or if the frame has changed itself to evil.com, and you're sending messages to it, this may be sensitive information, you definitely don't want, to end up, don't want this message to end up on the context belonging to evil.com. So you tell the browser, I believe that this frame has this origin, and if it does, this is indeed true, then send, me, send this message to that iframe, please. The iframe doesn't get this message by, by default. It needs to register an event handler, um, an event listener, to actually receive messages. And when it receives messages, um, it gets this event. And this event, the first thing you should do if you receive something is check where does this come from. Because anybody can send you messages. You have no idea whether this comes from your host page, from a, a sibling iframe, from just about anywhere. Uh, browser extensions do this as well, by the way. So first thing, you check where does this come from. Does this come from um, the frame or the, the context I expect it to come from? Yes, okay, in that case you can process it. If it's not, you can simply discard it and uh, don't process it at all. So again, this is where this origin com concept, which I told you was very important, um, this comes back here uh, again. The event, by the way, contains a reference to the frame that sent it. So you can use e.source, I think, to send it, uh, send a message back if you want to. Yes. So you really have to do the origin check. It's so anybody can send it, basically. Yes. Uh, now, why isn't this? Is there a motivation why it is incorporated? Uh, why the same origin policy is not extended to this post message? I mean that you can only send it to the same origin. Because it's intentionally, a, 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 it's a communication mechanism um, that's intended to be used across origins as well. Not only same origin, because if it's same origin, you actually don't really need it, because you can simply reach into the DOM and change things yourself. Um, this is actually intended to be, to be used for communication with other contexts, because there's no other way to reach that context except for this post message function. If, if, there's, <coughs> if there, are, there are so many ways to break origin policy these days, yeah. why do we even have it anymore? Just drop origin policy. What do you mean? I mean, between uh, allow from response headers necessary for OAuth, between web messaging, get request tricks, there's so many ways to, to, to defeat origin policy. So, and, and I feel like it's the foundation of web security and it's perverse what we're doing, right? Well, I, I, I digress, I'm just... I, I don't necessarily agree. There's ways to extract information from Maybe a few ways to extract information, but breaking the origin, same origin policy in the browser is definitely not something that's generally possible. Let me put it to you this way. As an attacker, origin policy doesn't slow me down at all. If I get scripted on your site, 
there's so many ways that I can, I can uh, still attack around origin policy. It's not an effective defense to stop many web-based attacks. True. Um, if you're talking about cross-site scripting and stuff like that, of course, once you have script running in a, in a context, it's game over. That, that's uh, definitely a valid assumption. But this is, these things are building blocks to actually um, work towards a, an architecture where you ac can actually enable security. Because I'm, I'm coming to, to scripts in, 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 in the second part, but in, let, let's go into it a bit here. In a nutshell, if you um, start putting scripts from just about anywhere inside your context, then at the end you have no idea what's happening. So you have all of this code, and maybe one of them is bad, maybe one of them will turn bad, um, nobody knows. That's fair. Um, and by, doing, by using these things to isolate stuff, as I will show in a bit, um, you can actually make sure that um, you keep your basic website, your base website, um, free of all these external influences, and then isolate them uh, as you see fit to avoid them from turning bad and compromising the whole thing. That's what this is about. Okay, so um, this is communication, checking the origins, very important. Um, one side note, if you're using this with a sandbox, um, like I said, a sandbox has this unique origin, um, which makes it a bit difficult to specify what the origin will be. Um, if you uh, canonicalize this unique origin, the browser will say null, uh, which is not a valid target for uh, a post message. So there, the only thing you can do is actually use a wildcard, which is uh, not very optimal. Um, but in the sandbox iframe, you can still check where the message came from and whether you want to process that or not. So, are there any questions about this? No, okay. Let's dive into... And, and this is to allow inter-frame communication, essentially, between two different origins. That's why this is mainly used for. Mm -hmm. gotcha. yep. Are there any other methods to pull that off besides using web messaging for older, older browsers? Or? Um, oof, I, I actually didn't check support for this because it's, it's very widespread. Gotcha. Um, the older mechanism would be uh, fragment identifier uh, communication, which is a, a hacky and flaky communication channel. So, onto scripts. So this was mainly browsing context. The browsing context um, has this document, has a session history, uh, but script contexts are uh, even more interesting and uh, more messy, uh, so to say. We already lifted the veil on that. So let's say you have a page and you load some, you load an Angular library, load some advertisements, and load some user data. Um, the question here is how many script contexts does this page have? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good answer. Um, if there no, uh, are no frames, then it's indeed one. Um, so every browsing context has one script context. So if you would include frames, each of these frames would have its own separate script context. Um, but if you don't, then it's one. So all of this external stuff, think about a modern web application. How many JavaScript files do you include there? Um, that's, that's a, yeah, that, that's a lot, right? All of this runs in one context. And that's, um, why I was going into these uh, building blocks before, because you can actually use them to build more secure applications. But let's talk a bit about scripts. So each browsing context has one, meaning that there's one shared scope, one shared namespace, and all these scripts live together. Um, and that's definitely um, probably not the most secure uh, setup. This lack of code isolation resulted in things like cross-site scripting. You put user data in your application, there's a script from the user in there, um, it's being executed in your context, it has full access to your application. Like Jim said, once I have a script running in your application, I can do whatever I want. There's virtually no way to constrain that anymore. Um, if you include an external library, you fully trust the provider of that library. Just like that. If they decide one day to become malicious, you're screwed. Uh, just like that. Happened with um, advertisement networks, for example. What did they do? Their business model is actually giving you data that has been provided by external parties, by users. And attackers use that, researchers as well, by the way, to give um, certain pieces of JavaScript and run them in millions and millions of websites. That's how they do these wide, uh, widespread studies on, on the web of how uh, certain countries deal with certain features, for example. So, a word about cross-site scripting. I'm sure um, we're going to go into that in a lot more detail in the rest of this week. I just want to um, lay the groundwork to define what it is and why it's a problem. So in a cross-site scripting attack, essentially if you have a search box like this and somebody enters a search term and a script tag and that happens, then you're in trouble. Um, if that's your website, um, you'll have some work to do this evening. Um, the reason is um, you're entering or getting user input and simply uh, rendering or processing in such a way 
that if there's a malicious script in there, it will be executed in your context. Meaning that, in this case, it can do an alert, it can do a lot more, as we saw um, with this list of origin protected resources. It used to be code only. Um, today, you can inject uh, all kinds of nasty stuff, which will cause a lot of problems on the web. You have CSS attacks, you have SVG attacks. You can even in start injecting HTML, um, like form buttons or form fields, and hope to trick the user to entering some sensitive information and leak that to another website. This is only um, the beginning of cross-site scripting. There are frameworks like Beef, the browser exploitation framework, that actually um, come pre-configured with a, a whole lot of commands you can simply execute once you've injected this uh, hook script. So you can start selecting from the list, I wanna um, get some pictures from the user's webcam and start simply hit the execute button and in comes the picture data, just like that. Because the website where this hook is running has permission to access the webcam. Uh, once permission is given, all scripts running in that web page can access uh, or use these permissions. Meaning that if such a web page includes an advertisement, that advertisement can grab pictures from your webcam, just like that. Colleagues of mine did a study a couple of years ago about how bad the problem is with third-party inclusions. Um, so JavaScript included from just about anywhere. And they found that 88.5% of the top 10,000 sites included at least one remote JavaScript library. Um, this is a couple of years ago, I think 2012. So we can imagine today this is going to be even uh, higher the number. They printed this on the graph, and you see that um, most of the websites include scripts from five, maybe ten hosts, that's the, the large percentage here. One website managed to include scripts from 296 different remote hosts. Um, you can imagine at that point you have no idea what code is running in your origin, you have uh, no idea what's happening, so there's essentially no way to provide anything uh, security-wise uh, anymore. Same thing for the, the, the very popular inclusions. Think about Google Analytics. Um, their slogan is anywhere, anytime. Well, I think you can add everywhere there as well. Um, if somebody manages to hack that tomorrow and put some additional JavaScript code in there, he will control 90% of the internet with one, pe one, one piece of JavaScript. Um, if Google decides they want to get some more information or want to deface all your websites, they can do that uh, by modifying one single JavaScript file. And that's the world where we live in. And that's definitely not a secure setup, in my opinion. Yes? This is why Google Analytics offers two options, right? Option one is to point to their JavaScript, and option two is to grab their JavaScript and just directly embed it in, in your site. So it depends on how you deploy analytics. And most people, they put the script link in and link, link, link to it directly. But you have another option to avoid that, that risk. I just want to point that out. Yeah. Is, that, is that fair? Um, I haven't looked at the specific code that you can put in your site. Yeah, let's um, give you two, two selections, the script tag or, or the actual content yeah. if you don't trust Google. Okay, and it doesn't pull in additional scripts? No. Okay. In that case, that's, that's a fair, fair addition. Uh, you, you asked for my commentary. No, so ab I'm absolutely. That's absolutely. a dangerous thing to ask for. <laughs> <laughs> a, a comparable scenario, if you want to embed a Twitter widget, um, you get this link and, and a script tag, and then they start pulling in additional scripts. So. Um, I agree with you. I this, haven't looked this, at this the Google is a code. systemic problem across the whole yeah, First of all, absolutely. I'm just picking on you. You're right. This is a systemic problem across the whole web. So you, yes, I'm, I'm absolutely. But in case uh, they offer the option to put the code in yourself, um, definitely do that. Um, and look at what it does because it, um, that's the only way to guarantee that it actually does what you expect it to do. But scripts, um, security, um, I have a few other things I want to talk about. First of all, what happens when you load a script from a CDN? What happens when you load a script like Google Analytics? All you have is a name. So you go to a CDN and you say, I want this specific Angular file. And the CDN has a file and it looks like Angular and it gives you this file and you have this Angular application. What happens if somebody attacks the CDN, puts some malicious code there, which has, happens to have the same name? Well, you get you request a script and you get a malicious script in return. And that's another um, very systemic problem we have on the web. There's no way uh, to know what code you're loading. You have to hope that that's what you're getting. Um, maybe it was that code when you looked at it, maybe it changes, maybe somebody changed it. Uh, maybe Angular people screwed up and over, uh, over, have overridden this with some other code. There's essentially very little you can do to protect yourself against that. And this happens in practice as well. So this is from um, 2015. Um, China um, launched an attack against GitHub and they did it by uh, changing uh, analytics code from Baidu. So they instructed the code to make requests to GitHub, and then they served that code to millions of Chinese users who started making requests to GitHub. 
But essentially, it's a, a by design botnet that they uh, used to attack GitHub for some uh, stupid issues that they had with GitHub. Uh, the reason here is not too important. The reason I want to talk about this is first of all, this is a problem, but also there's a solution since a couple of years. And that solution is called sub resource integrity. And with sub resource, resource integrity, you can actually um, assure that you know what you're loading and you can protect yourself against this kind of attack. So if you want to load this Angular library, what it allows you to do is it allows you to specify this integrity attribute. And this integrity attribute comes into play when you load the library and you get it. Then the browser will actually ch verify the checksum of this library against what you specified in your script tag. And if it matches, you get your Angular library. And if it doesn't match, you get this error saying that you're trying to load something, but it doesn't match to what you wanted or what you expected. So the browser is protecting you against this kind of attack and making sure you don't get this modified um, file. Of course, it doesn't mean that the file is necessarily um, malicious. It's simply that it, mod it's, it has been modified and no, no longer matches the checksum that you specified here. This allows you, you can catch this error by the way, so it allows you to, um, to try, try another uh, source or even host uh, a copy of the file yourself which you load in as a final uh, last resort to actually get the library you want. Of course, this is the bit we're talking about. It's never that easy, right? It's never uh, as easy as adding this integrity stuff and you're done because um, this is what people envisioned. We'll just do this and then somebody thought, yeah, but you can steal data using this, uh, this technique. So what happens if you add this integrity and you go to a certain API which gives you an account balance? Let's say the balance uh, something like this uh, for the kind of money you have in your account. You can, if you know the format, you can pre-compute the checksum of this add it as an integrity attribute and simply try to get a file. If you get an error, the file doesn't exist. If you don't get an error, the file actually exists and you know what the info, the contents of the file is. Uh, even though this is sitting on the, on the bank website um, behind, uh, behind an authorization point that checks the user's credentials because you run this code from within the user's browser. So you can try all of these options until you find one that actually matches. And at that point, you can't read the file because the same version policy will prevent you from doing that unless you enable course, but that's... Uh, um, but what you actually can do here is you know that the file exists and you know the contents of the file. So you have some kind of information leak here. Um, and that's why this is not that simple and why SRI, sub-resource integrity, actually requires course permissions to make the call. And it looks like this. So course is this very complex policy, which I'm not going to go into detail. Um, essentially what it comes down to is course uh, allows a server to give the browser permission to share this file with another origin. Something that didn't, wasn't possible on the web before course um, and something that causes a lot of problems um, if it would all of a sudden become possible, like SRI would enable this. So that's all I'm going to tell about uh, course today. What it means is instead of simply specifying this integrity attribute, you need to add this cross-origin attribute saying whether you want uh, cookies to be used for the call or not. Anonymous means no cookies, uh, use credentials means send cookies along and check whether the server is aware that this is happening. The browser will include this origin header saying, again the origin concept, saying to the server, this call is coming from example.com, allowing the server to make a decision, do I want to allow this or not? If a legacy server, a server at the bank who is not aware about this thing, the bank will never include this header just like that. So the browser at this point already knows the server didn't opt in, I'm not going to do it, um, it's not okay. If the server opts in, specifying I, I am aware what course is, I want to share this resource with other origins, star means anybody, <coughs> at that point, the server can actually, well, the browser can actually start verifying the checksum and giving you the file. Um, so yes, SRI is a bit messy because the web is messy, um, but once you know what this means and what it does, <coughs> this actually becomes very useful. Yes? You know, you don't want to talk about course now, but Anyway, uh, everywhere where I see on the web, people run into like, oh, it doesn't work because, well, of course. And, uh, and everyone just says, okay, take the headers, just dynamically put them in the response and send it back. Yeah. Um, of course. If That's you know. Almost every answer on Stack Account is Stack Stack Is the answer reflecting the origin or is it simply uh, adding a star? A star reflecting the origin. I don't know. It's Almost all of Google's OAuth and other secure endpoints are all access control out origin star. Yeah. So in order to have like a real major front end service, you have got to drop origin policy for it to work. 
especially if you're doing things like OAuth against JS clients and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. That's, um, a, that's why I'm saying origin policy. I, let, I'm, let's I'm let's sensational. Let's origin go into it. Let's go into it. Let's um, adapt your news facts with, <laughs> with true information. So. <laughs> <laughs> Am I providing fake news? Cross, <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go for it. Let's go for it. So cross origin allow access star um, essentially allows any origin access to the file, but it doesn't work if credentials are used to make the call. So um, okay, if I would say um, like like the example I had here, um, use credentials here, then the browser would attach cookies to the request. But if cookies were present on this request then the server knows that this request, well, the browser knows that this request has been made with credentials. And if the server doesn't explicitly acknowledge the fact that credentials have been used, the call will be blocked anyway. So this means that there should be a header here, cross origin allow credentials, true. And the star is not allowed to be used when credentials are being used. So specifying a star essentially means anybody can access this. This is public information. That's what it comes down to. Um, and this means that if this call is made with credentials, this will never be accepted by the browser. So what do you mean by call credentials? I, just don't, I, I don't understand that level of depth. Well, cookies, essentially. So, OK, um, I'm going to skip ahead. I, I, I have one I'm more sorry if I'm derailing you. I have one more slide on course. No, no, it's fine. Um, um, so I actually wanted to come back to this um, to tell you that course um, heavily depends on the origin and that it comes back there as well. So this is a course call with credentials. So if you make an XHR call, um, you specify a URL here, which can be cross origin, that's fine. If you send it um, just like that without doing this line, then no cookies will be present on the cross origin call. It's a get request. There's no origin policy on get requests. I'm confused. There is if you use XHR. Because with XHR, you actually get raw access to the response. So if you get a get request, uh, get a response back here, uh, regardless of what this is, HTML and image JavaScript, with XHR, you can do XHR.response text. And that's something that was never, ever possible. You're right, a get request has always been possible to render an image. But I can't get to the content. You can't get to the content. So if you a, get so to a get... XHR, I actually get the content yes. back so I can... If ah, you I get the content, if the headers match. And that's why it's so important. You have always been able to get an image, but you have never been able to actually get the contents of that image. My fake news has been trumped. I get it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's a credentialed call. So you have to ex explicitly say, um, with credentials, then the browser will do it. It will include the cookie, but it will also look for the server actually acknowledging the fact that this call um, has been made with credentials. If the server doesn't say true there, and a, an explicit origin here, star is not, not longer valid uh, with credentials, then only then will the call succeed and will you get access to the response here at the, in the browser. This requires cooperation and, and standard compliance on the browser. I mean, this, if you have a malicious browser, intentionally or not so intentionally. Yeah, then, but then all bets are off anyway. Yeah. Yes. So you, you can start your Chrome without the same origin policy as well, uh, which is not very recommended. <laughs> cool. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's tons of configuration. Yeah, the, the reason that option exists, by the way, uh, well, I, I found some posts that it's taken out, but the reason that option exists is to run tests where you actually want to inspect this thing from another origin, but um, you shouldn't ever run it as a user like that. Uh, welcome to the web, I would say. So, is, does that answer, answer your question? Let me try to find where I was. I should have, okay, I'm coming it here. So. Okay, so the star is, um, is meant to be used for public resources only. So I totally agree if, if somebody says uh, this is a default option, it's um, bad, but it's not um, the end of the world. If somebody would say, yeah, it, it's fine, simply um, echo back the origin where it came from and add some other headers, then you're in, in trouble if, if you set it up like that. Yeah, if they do it like that, then um, that's very, very bad advice. Yeah. Okay, so now you can start responding and saying, no, 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 don't do it like that. That guy said it's not okay. <laughs> All right, so SRI in practice, um, actually a lot of CDNs offer this um, by default already, so you can copy script tags with SRI. Um, of course, then you kind of have to trust that their checksums are okay, um, but you, there's some trust at some point anyway. You can also do it yourself. There are tools that do it for you. You can do it from the command line. Uh, it's very, very easy. 
So if you're really paranoid, you download the file, you inspect it. If you're absolutely paranoid, you download it from different locations, compare them all together, and then calculate the checksum yourself and put that in your HTML source. Then you can be pretty sure that uh, when it matches, you actually get the right Angular library. Um, support is still a bit limited, but um, this will definitely be coming in, in the coming, uh, hopefully, months. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I talked about using these different contexts um, before to isolate stuff. Well, this becomes really useful when you're talking about scripts. So with scripts, what you actually want to do is you want to start um, doing some privilege separation. And one very good example I have in the next slide is from Dropbox. So Dropbox, um, they, they did this whole security overhaul uh, a couple of years ago, and they have some very interesting blog posts about what they're doing security-wise. So Jim already mentioned their uh, password storage policy. They actually described it in the blog post. They do some crazy stuff there, uh, which is very interesting to see, very uh, good to see how, how a big corporation does it. They did a similar thing for their website. So they try to separate, uh, separate some privileges. They have, for example, this uh, chat widget where you can chat with an employee for support. And this comes from a third party, which they don't necessarily trust. And they don't know what permissions the thing needs and whatever. So instead of simply plopping it in the main Dropbox.com origin, where also access to your files uh, exists, they actually isolated that in a separate context in an iframe and used web messaging to actually accomplish communication with that. And that's what this, this thing is about. And that's why these building blocks are so important because we actually have the building blocks to achieve privilege separation on the web. Nobody uses them because everybody is used to simply start uh, plopping all JavaScript into your uh, main context and stuff works, but it's not very secure. So in practice, um, if you load a document uh, from a different origin in a frame, you actually already have protection from the same origin policy. So the, the browser will keep that stuff separated from your main main context. Um, you can put it in a sandbox iframe and you even have a unique origin, which is even uh, better. And then communication with the web messaging API makes this all practical. So the Dropbox example, here's a link to the blog post. The slides are on the, on the SCED website, by the way, so you can grab a copy of them. Um, what they do is, um, when they, they start this support chat, this which is called Snap Engage. That's the company that builds this uh, chat thingy. They start sending messages there, um, and that's the functions that sit behind it. And you can see here, um, send message is essentially um, what they do. Uh, they do the post message call. So here's the post message call. They send some data, and they, they have the origin there. Um, so these things can eff effectively be used to isolate sensitive or untrusted parts of your application into a separate origin. <coughs> requires a bit of effort to uh, set up the communication, but once you've done that, you actually get a lot of benefits um, by doing it like that. So now XSS against, XSS against the chat window through my chats have no effect on Dropbox or my files. That's why they do this. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Well, actually, the main reason they did this is my next topic, content security policy. So the main reason they did this, they wanted to enforce restrictions on their main page. They knew what their code did, and they said, okay, we're only gonna try to allow what our code needs and restrict anything else. But this widget um, kind of got in the way when they tried to do that because it needed additional resources and they uh, would have needed to whitelist all of that in their main origin. And that's why they said, let's split this out. Let's put this in a separate context and we can apply our own security policy on our own stuff and let the widget do whatever it needs in its own context, and if it gets compromised, it's their problem and not really our problem. And that's what it comes down to. What attacks does this prevent? What, like what, it, it, it lets them do their security policy more effectively. Yes. Is, and it's basically XSS prevention is why you do stuff like this. Yes. Any other attacks they're worried about with this kind of mechanism? Um, for them, it was mainly um, cross-site scripting and, and CSP, yeah. So the reason they wanted to do this is because they wanted to deploy CSP to protect against or to um, have a second layer of defense against cross-site scripting. Again, this is a complex policy. I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm going to cover this in more detail in my talk on Wednesday when I talk about Angular security because CSP is very um, easy to use or very um, powerful in combination with something like Angular. But I'm going to give you the idea of what CSP is. So if you're interested, you can either come to the talk or look it up yourself or uh, find some other resources. So first of all, CSP is not a replacement for traditional XSS mitigation. So you still, should still protect against cross-site scripting in, in every way possible. But CSP can be used as a second layer of defense. Because CSP, if you enable this on your web pages, by default, it will 
disable dangerous features like inline scripts, inline styles. And which are, what, what are inline scripts? The stuff the user has injected into a comment that uh, simply sits within all of this data, inline script block, uh, trying to execute something that will be blocked. And if it's not in line, if it's a remote script that's being loaded, these must be explicitly whitelisted. So um, that's where the browser will need to check a list. Is the script in there? Yes, okay, I will load it. If it's not in there, I will not load it. Um, by the way, there are some problems with this approach, uh, but that's something for Wednesday. CSP started out as this uh, content security policy, like getting control of the content running and being loaded in your page. Since then, people have started uh, putting uh, a lot of additional features in there. Um, as we will see undoubtedly throughout the week, um, things like frame ancestors and other stuff. So what's important about CSP? Well, essentially, um, it also restricts other types of content. You can restrict uh, form submissions, for example, in, in level two. So if somebody manages to inject a form, you can prevent that from being submitted to an attacker server, things like that. So um, CSP is definitely powerful, but it's fairly complex to set up can control outgoing requests, you even can configure sandboxes from CSP, so um, there's a lot of stuff in there that can help you uh, build more secure applications. Support, level two is actually, um, we, we saw this before, level two is coming uh, and along quite nicely, um, and most browsers will support this in the coming um, months, probably. Any questions about scripts and their not so secure behavior by default. Okay, brings me to the last part, um, which is about sessions, cookies, and tokens. Um, it's not a talk about session management, it's a talk about um, how these security concepts within the browser are applied to these things, how patterns you've been using uh, day in, day out actually depend on the presence of the same origin policy and on origin-based security. So a very short refresher about session management. I'm sure that other people will go into a lot more detail there um, during this week. If you have a browser and a server, if you make a request, you get this session cookie from the server um, using, it doesn't even matter whether it's a session ID or a session object or whatever. It's a cookie, that's what matters here. You have this context being loaded in the browser and the cookie being stored for your domain. Um, funny fact, cookies are associated with the domain, not with an origin. Um, a very bad call made 20 years ago. Um, causing a lot of security problems we have today. If you make a request, the browser automatically um, sees this domain is www.example.com. Oh, I have a cookie for that domain. Let me attach that to the request when it goes out and the server will know who you are based on this session information in the cookie. And that's it. That's server side. Well, that's session management with cookies. Um, doesn't matter where the server side or client side. Why is this a problem? Like I said, cookies are domain related, not origin related. So you can imagine if you have HTTP and HTTPS, uh, parts of your website, well, the domain will stay the same, it's a scheme that differs. So the origin is different, but the cookie is still shared among both. That's one of the problems. Second problem is that they had this very uh, great idea to make cookies accessible from JavaScript, uh, which turns into uh, problems like session hijacking through JavaScript calls, uh, things like that. Two common defenses, you probably heard about this. Um, if you haven't, it's time to crawl uh, out from under the rock you've been hiding under and uh, take a look at, at the web that we have today. We have the secure flag for cookies and the HTTP only flag. Um, people often ask me, so, or get confused, this is about JavaScript access, this is about HTTPS, this is not the HTTP for HTTPS, don't, don't, doesn't matter. So the secure flag tells the browser, this cookie should only be attached to requests going out over HTTPS. So never include it over HTTP and let's be safe, which is good. Um, should be the default for all your cookies, by the way. And HTTP only says um, this cookie should not be accessed from uh, JavaScript, so only attach it to requests, don't give it to a script context requesting my cookies. Yes? And there's a way to evade HTTP only through cookie clobbering, right? Um, cookie, cookie forcing, I believe. So I can, I can delete HTTP only cookies and replace them if that's all you depend upon for security. So yes. Please be careful to find yes. that flag. Is it, it's a cookie jar overflow, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a cookie jar overflow attack. Yeah. Because so, so um, very often with a double submit cookie defense, you do not match that server side. 
So I can now use cookie flooding to force out your HP only cookie with the CSRF token, overwrite it, and I got around your CSRF defense. Yeah. Any yeah. XSS defense trumps CSRF. But it, it highly depends on browsers because some browsers don't allow it, I think, and others. Uh, others Chrome do. recently fixed it, and Safari takes about a thousand cookies, which is no big deal. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's still a problem. Chrome, you're right. Chrome fixed it in like 51, I think. Yeah. Again. You asked, remember, you well, asked welcome for to my the... participation. I'm happy to give that to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring some stroke waffles next time. So if you're too annoying, I can give you a waffle. And <laughs> <laughs> you're like, stick up. A stroke waffle will shut me up. <laughs> There's sugar in there, right? A, There's sugar in there, I right? I think it is yeah. sugar, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's my, my problem. All right, so I'm not going to go into detail on these two flags. Um, they're probably well known, and after a year or 10, uh, server-side frameworks are actually starting to enable them by default, which is a good thing. Yeah. Can I ask you one more question? Yes. Just stop at any time, please. What the hell do you mean by cookies are associated with domain, not an origin? I have no idea what that means. Because they're the same thing to me. So can you help explain to, to yeah. us? All right, so I'll, I'll go back to the first slide. <laughs> so, the concept of an origin, we, we have a scheme, a host, and a port, and these three are the origin. And cookies are associated with this only. Yeah, only with the host, not even the port. Not, not even a port, no. That's why it's secure for the host. So, Yeah, okay, it depends on terminology. Um, this is, this is, uh, I think this is called the host in the spec. Um, in, in not, it's not in DNS terms. So this would be the register domain, this is a TLD, this would be the host in DNS terms, but in, in cookie terms, this is the host, I think. I would have to. Yeah, it doesn't matter. This, this part of the URL is, is what a uh, cookie is associated with. Not this and not this. So if, this, um, if you have HTTP or HTTPS here, it doesn't matter. The cookie will be there. That's why you need this secure flag to tell uh, the browser that a cookie is only for the HTTPS version of a specific host. Yep. Which is... Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, what was that? So there is no solution for the issue on the phone? No. No, if you run applications on different ports on the same domain, uh, the cookies will be there. Okay. Um, again, welcome to the web. <laughs> that's why a talk like this is actually necessary. It's, it's a pity sometimes, but um, that's the world we live in and what we have to deal with. Okay, so these things are fairly well known. They have been around for uh, definitely a couple of years. Cookie prefixes um, are a bit more patchwork to fix cookies, um, have been around for a couple of months only, so this is very new. Um, actually very well supported in browsers uh, today. And a cookie prefix is, um, brace yourself, it's, you can add this to the name of the cookie up front, which is underscore underscore secure dash, um, and then the name of the cookie and a value. And if you do it like that, you actually tell the browser to um, apply additional restrictions to your cookie. Um, the main reason you need this is for things like this cookie clobbering thing. Um, if you set uh, a cookie um, as a server, you can set it with all the flags you want, but when you get it back, you get a name and a value, and you have no idea where the cookie came from. Was it the cookie you set securely before? Who knows? Is it the cookie that somebody set um, from a different context for the entire domain? Nobody knows. The server definitely doesn't know. And with cookie prefixes, the server gets these assurances um, from, from the browser. So the server sets a cookie with this name. And if the browser is modern enough, he will uh, enforce restrictions, meaning that if this cookie with this name was set over the HTTP connection, the browser simply says no. That, that's not a valid configuration, uh, which isn't the case for the secure flag, by the way. Um, this is not a valid configuration. I'm not going to set that cookie. So this, the fact that that cookie is being sent back to the server, if the browser is modern enough, this means that the cookie must have been set over a secure connection which uh, takes it again to the whole certificate validation thing, but that's uh, definitely not uh, important here. Yes? This essentially lets me do secure, secure flags on an attribute by attribute basis. Is that the point of this? I, I, this looks like overkill to me. I, I still don't understand. Um, the main advantage here is, first of all, um, but because this is part of a name, you will get this back. It's, you can consider this a secure flag for uh, the outgoing cookie header. So You're talking about the, the, like any cookie you have like 
X number of name value pairs. This is for the name value pair values within a cookie. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Within so, one cookie, I can have multiple names, uh, attributes, and attribute values, right? Okay, I can have like users, Jim. Uh, yeah, no, that's, in, a, in a set cookie header, you can set multiple cookies, uh, yeah. but they're separate cookies. So no, what this thing does, this as a server, you can add this to your name, so that's not very important, but if you get a cookie request header, if you get cookies from the browser, then you actually get some information which is part of the name about how the cookie was set in the browser. So if you receive a cookie, let's say you set a want to set a cookie name equals Jim. Okay, you send this set cookie name equals Jim and you get it back. Uh, that's the simple default cookie behavior. If I set a, a cookie called underscore underscore secure dash name equals Jim, and I send this, I should include some schematics here. I send this to the browser. Um, the browser will check whether this cookie is, be set, is being set over an HTTPS connection or not. If we are talking in HTTP, the browser will say, uh-uh, that's not cool, and it will not even set the cookie. If we're talking HTTPS, sure, the browser sets the cookie. Then you come back, and I get a cookie, I receive a cookie from the browser saying underscore underscore secure dash name equals Jim. At that moment, I can see, hey, this thing is there, meaning that, okay, this is Firefox, whatever the current version is, it supports these prefixes. At that point, I know that Firefox has handled this in a very secure way. And that's, yeah. this indeed is a secure cookie, and not something that somebody has said by driving out other cookies from the jar or something else. Yes, it is absolutely messy, I totally agree. Um, but people think this is a good idea, and every browser supports it today. Uh, and they have a second prefix, which is underscore underscore host. Um, they actually made a very good call there. They say, if you want to use this, the secure uh, restrictions here will be applied by default, which is awesome. Um, <coughs> And the second thing is, um, what, what this does actually, this um, prevents a cookie from being sent to an entire domain and uh, ties it to a host only. Um, so essentially when you set this and you get this back, you know that you as a server have given out this cookie and not some, some, uh, some, uh, something else running on a higher level domain or in, on a sibling domain. Uh, very important for certain attack vectors, um, but a very messy, messy thing here. So currently supported in all modern browsers. Um, the Can I Use website doesn't have this, so I don't have explicit version numbers, but um, it has been like this for uh, at least uh, three months, I think. So, again, the web is, um, security on the web is not that simple. Um, Jim actually asked me when he came in, does it exist, a security model for the web? Well, it exists, but it's, it's hairy. Um, <laughs> and we have things, uh, other problems with cookies as well. And one of these problems is CSERF. CSERF actually stands for cross-site request forgery, which is uh, a mouthful and better explained with pictures. So I have a scenario. Let's say you have a website here and you have a browser. What happens if you go to the website and you log in is that you get a cookie. The cookie is stored at the browser alongside with the domain name. If you make another request, the cookie is attached by the browser and you get your uh, personal data, which is awesome. If I open a second website, of course with cat pictures, if they haven't been banned from the internet, you get a separate context, remember, same origin policy. So this context runs in a different origin, has a different domain, will not be able to access this cookie, um, so this is isolated from that. But this can make get requests, this can make post requests even to another origin, that's how the web works. So this one can submit a form to this uh, URL, it will trigger navigation here, so it will uh, change origins after that, um, and it will no longer be able to access the contents, but it can make the post request. And if this server doesn't, well, the browser helpfully sees, oh, this is just going to website.b, let me attach that cookie here and send it out. And if this server is not aware that this is going to happen, he simply executes this request as it came from here, which it doesn't, obviously. And at that moment, you have cross-site request forge, because you have a cross-site request originating from an origin with any site.io going to website.b, cross-origin or cross-site, um, and the request is being forged um, to do something that you didn't expect. So this is a problem, um, and the real problem here is that you don't know the intent of a request. You don't know um, whether this request actually came from here or here, whether it was intended and came from here or unintended and came from here. And that's what uh, CSERF boils down to um, at the root. So again, like I said in the beginning, if you're not aware that this can happen, it's very unlikely that you implement defenses against this. Uh, you, you must need to think about this yourself or know about this if you want to protect against this. Fortunately, CSERF is very well known. 
Um, it's on the OWASP.10. Uh, a lot of people know about it. Uh, a lot of uh, people write about it. So hopefully, um, most developers know about this. But there have been cases where people didn't know about it. One case is eBay. eBay had this thing in 2013, a very nasty CSERF vulnerability, um, allowing people to hijack um, eBay accounts using CSERF. So let me quickly explain what happened there, uh, just to show you how sticky uh, vulnerabilities like this really can be. So you have, you have eBay. You have this uh, context from the attacker. Um, the user is authenticated to eBay. That's the cookie here. Um, this context, again, cannot directly read and use that cookie, but it can send requests. So what they did is they sent a request to change the telephone number from your account. eBay. Um, well, they actually were aware for, of CSERF, but they forgot to implement that for that specific uh, call. <coughs> so the browser attaches the cookie, and the server says, sure, I'll change the phone number for Philip. Of course, but why, why is this important? Because eBay uses that phone number to confirm your identity to reset your password. It's like the second factor to, um, to do some password reset, and you need a phone number. Of course, if the attacker can change that, he can simply... Um, connect to eBay uh, from his own machine, say, reset the password for Philip's account. And eBay is like, yes, but I'm going to be secure. I'm going to give you a call first, and you need to enter this token or whatever. But the phone number has been changed already. So I can simply, the attacker receives the password code, can reset the eBay account, and um, start bidding in your name or cancel your auctions or whatever. That's a very real-life example of a CSERF uh, attack. And the second example is something that happens in, in probably every one of your homes. If you have something like this, um, these things are notoriously insecure. Um, they are vulnerable to CSERF attacks. Anybody can make a request from within your browser to your router. Uh, they simply have to guess um, essentially where it is, most likely at this IP address or something like that. And they can even start authenticating your name. So what you do first is you make a request with admin admin, and hopefully that succeeds. You can simply try this whole list of default credentials, um, because if it succeeds, um, the, the router will send you a cookie, which will be stored in the browser. You cannot access the cookie, but it will be stored. And once the cookie is there, um, well, after you've tried all of them, you can try, try changing uh, DNS settings. Um, the browser will attach the cookie. The router doesn't care where it's coming from. He simply changes the DNS settings, and your router is essentially compromised. Uh, very nasty attack, uh, very problematic. They actually did something similar to printers uh, a couple of weeks ago. So they uh, started sending requests to printers sitting on the network, uh, starting printing stuff and hacking printers, essentially, from within the browser. This happened in practice. Um, in South America, they had these uh, farming attacks. When they first <coughs> changed the NS settings on routers, and then they start redirecting your traffic to try and sell you whatever um, they can think of, uh, essentially. <coughs> so CSERF is definitely a problem. It's there because the browser helpfully attaches cookies to outgoing requests, and the server isn't able to make the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate requests. Right after this attack, Brazil got hit. Brazil, Brazil home routers got hit, and five million people got popped by the same attack. So this this got really bad in, in Brazil yeah. and South yeah. America. Right? Absolutely. So real life thing happening, um, and shouldn't even be possible to begin with. So let's talk defenses. Um, First defense you can use against CSERF um, has been around for quite some time. Uh, essentially, what it comes down to is if you log in, um, you get this welcome page, and inside the page, uh, there's this hidden token. So um, whenever there's a form you need to submit, the, browser, the server will hide the token in that form. And when you submit the form, it will check whether the token is there or not. And this essentially means that if this is uh, a form to, to send a message, there will be a token here. The token will be submitted as part of the form verified here, and um, that should be enough. Because if this happens, well, it looks like this, and hit a form field, CSERF token, and some value, should probably be a bit more random than this one. So if, if the same scenario from before happens, um, this form will still be submitted, the cookie will still be there, but there's no token here. Because to get a token, you need to get this page from the server, but this is protected by the same origin policy. And that's why I, I told you in the beginning that a lot of stuff builds on top of this protection from the browser, the fact here that the hidden token cannot be extracted from another context because the browser prevents that this is essentially the, the <coughs> basis for the CSER defense. So the server here will know that this is not OK because the token isn't there. And he will simply say that this is not, uh, not good. It will prevent this from happening. Second defense is the origin header. Um, 
So again, you have the cookie. If we send a message, uh, the server is happy. That's fine. Um, what can happen here is um, if you send a message here. OK, sorry, there was a mistake here. So the browser will attach this origin header saying where the request came from. Um, so what you can do here um, is check the origin header here. It's, it's added by the browser, so it's uh, a true value. And this will not match your uh, website, so you can definitely know who's making the call and decide whether you want that or not. Um, turns out um, that Jim is, is busy reading his emails, but he told me actually before the talk that Firefox has problems with this origin header. So that it's not uh, attached consistently, so it's apparently not um, not good enough to trust for C-Serve defenses. Yeah, this is, I, I, I emailed you the exact bug, so Firefox to this day is not sending origin header even with post requests. And, it is, and a lot of people are screaming about it, um, and Firefox has committed to fix it soon, but they've been saying that for a couple of years. <laughs> So okay. this, is, this is why what, what Twitter does is they start with an origin header check. If the origin header is missing, they'll, then they'll scrape the origin out of the, out of the <coughs> refer header. And if the refer header is missing, they'll reject. Yeah, okay. Thanks. I, I actually didn't know about the book. So. I, I emailed you. Well, yeah. so awesome. So that's um, another way. Fortunately, there are two other mechanisms, so don't worry if this doesn't work. Um, the third one. Um, is transparent tokens or, or double cookies or double uh, whatever. Um, it's essentially the solution you use when you're uh, building an application that doesn't submit forms. Because many applications today, they do everything with XHR, with JavaScript, no forms are there. So what can you do then? Well, again, if you log in, you get a page, you get two cookies from the server. You get uh, a session cookie and a CSERF token cookie. And if you um, submit a message, the two cookies will be there added by the browser. But you copy this blue cookie into a blue token. Um, I'm going to show you in a bit how you do that. It's essentially your JavaScript code copies the value of this cookie, which is readable from JavaScript, uh, kind of necessary here, to a header. And the server can compare both blue values here. If you do it in a cross-site fashion, again, the cookies will be attached automatically by the browser. But this token um, comes from this cookie. And this cookie cannot be read by this context. Again, the browser security policy at work. So the server will know that something is wrong. And this highly depends on the fact that you have this uh, CSERF token cookie, which you copy to a CSERF token header. And from there, you can actually um, detect whether a request was legitimate or not, or came from your own context or not. So it can't be HTTP only to pull this off? No, that cookie cannot. <coughs> so the fourth defense is actually the newest one. Um, Shiny new. Actually, it's called same side cookies. And same side cookies um, come down to the fact that you set a cookie, um, it's still stored by the browser, and attached to outgoing requests, um, but it will not be attached to cross origin requests. And how do you do that? Well, simply by saying same site equals strict. And this tells the browser this cookie is meant to be used for my site only. So if a request comes from another, another context, like any site.io, simply don't attach the cookie which is, in my opinion, how cookies should have worked from day one. Uh, if they would have done this from day one, CSERF would not have been an issue. Um, so now we actually have this feature. Um, unfortunately, um, browser support is still a bit limited, um, but it will come. So it, it doesn't hurt. Um, OK, the URI is, is wrong here, but that, that, that doesn't matter. This screenshot is correct. So it doesn't hurt to set this cookie uh, or this attribute to your cookies, um, but be aware that that alone is not enough to protect against CSERF for the coming years, probably. Um, but you can start doing it anyway and phase out the other defenses if you want to. So here's a short overview of the different defenses against CSERF. Um, pick one that fits best. Uh, this one is often used in traditional web applications. This one is often used in things like uh, client-side applications, like an AngularJS. The origin header is not very relevant for traditional CSERF defenses. It comes into play in other scenarios, like um, <coughs> course and um, WebSockets, for example, and then same side cookies is very new and works quite well. OK. I have a last um, couple of slides I want to uh, talk about because they're still re relevant um, with the browser security model in mind. So cookies are one thing. You have JOT tokens now. JOT tokens are very, very hip, very trendy. Um, there's essentially a standard for representing claims between parties. Um, to be more concrete, a JOT token looks like this, this blob of data. 
This is base64 encoded, so it's not encrypted. It's simply <coughs> uh, data representing a header, a payload, and a signature. So essentially, you have some claims about who I am. I'm Philip. It expires in, in this much milliseconds, and it came from here. And this signature, um, essentially generated by the server with a secret, um, ensures that the token cannot be tampered with. Yes? The signature is not part of the JWG standard. It's, it's a separate standard called JWS, right? And it's, it is a fundamental part of, of JWT, I dare say. But JWTs do not require signatures, only if only the JWS standard does. Is, it, is that fair? No, I think, I think it does require no. no. So I, use of it in, in OAuth requires it in, in OIDC, but JWT by itself does not define signatures in any way. That's a separate standard. I'm not aware of, of what exactly is in which spec. Um, I know JWT is part of this whole identity suite based on JSON, gotcha. but I'm not sure whether the signature is part of JWS or not. What um, I'm trying to say is signature is the foundation of JWT security. Mm -hmm. A lot of people skip it, which completely compromises the system, so please use signatures. That's all I've saying. honestly never heard of an unsigned JWT token. JWT doesn't define signatures, it's JWS. Okay. I see it all the time. All right. Um, so always add a signature. <laughs> very, very important. Honestly, I don't even know of a library because there's plenty of library support. I don't know of libraries supporting uh, no signatures at all. That's awesome. Okay. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about is um, people often pitch like cookies versus tokens and, and uh, try to convince you of using one versus the other and they both have their, their potential security problems. Well. Um, Job tokens uh, and cookies are not the right discussion. So essentially, um, cookies versus tokens doesn't matter because a token is a representation, like a session identifier, but you can just as well store a job token in a cookie. So uh, the real question is, are you using a cookie or are you using the authorization <coughs> header to transfer the data? And that's um, essentially uh, what this discussion really is about. And in light of the security model of the web, uh, this matters for CSER. So a job token, you simply send it to the browser um, if you use a cookie, then the browser will handle everything for you, but you need to deal with things like CSER. If you send it to the browser as a simple response, as part of a JSON object, then your client-side code will have to attach the token to outgoing requests, which is what you do in an Angular application. More on that in the session about Angular security. So essentially, the, if you do it um, yourself, you store it in your client-side context, and that's where the script context come in, comes into play and where you have this privilege uh, separation. If you store your token, Inside your client-side context, all scripts running in that context will be able to access that token uh, and even export it. That's why you definitely want to separate these things out and put untrusted code in its own context. So the authorization header um, is something used to transmit this token. It's simply a, a request header. Um, you store it in memory, or you can use local storage, which is one of the facilities in the browser. And we talked about that in the beginning. This is origin-based uh, origin or with origin constraints. So anything with your origin has access to this token, if you use it like that. <coughs> Brings me to the last couple of slides, um, a few examples of where this actually starts becoming important and starts mattering in, in scenarios which you use in your web applications. Can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yeah. So you can stop anytime, please. Back, well, back we have six, six more minutes, so. Back one more. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, had, I had two. Uh, <laughs> Back one, I'm sorry. You mentioned local storage. That, that, that's yeah, just triggering. Here. Local storage, it, one access session is gone. So is local storage the right place to shove jots and similar? Or is well, session storage or something else? Or? Um, depends on, on what you want to support. So the different session storage is per browsing context. So um, we talked about this in the beginning. If you have two frames of the same origin, they can both access the same local storage. Uh, that's shared among the origin. Session storage is associated with one browsing context only. So if you want to have one authenticated context and want to re-authenticate in a second one, then session storage is perfectly fine. Um, but it's not necessarily protected from, from cross-site scripting. Um, if that context has a vulnerability, you're still screwed. So, so rather than local storage, I, I recommend an HTTP-only cookie instead, which is protected against JavaScript attacks. That's, yeah. all, that's all I'm trying to say. No, that's, local storage yeah. is, a bad, is a bad place to put sensitive data. <coughs> Again, it, it depends, de depends entirely on, on the threat model. Um, some people say that if you have cross-site scripting vulnerability, you're screwed anyway, because they have script running in the origin. They can, instead of simply stealing your token, they can start um, 
becoming a man in the browser with beef and start taking over the application, framing everything and hiding from there. So it, it depends a bit. Um, you, you can go both ways. So again, it's, it's where you put it um, and where you have to take into account. If you put it in a cookie, you protect it from cross-site scripting uh, in HTTP only, that's fair. Um, but you need to deal with CSERF on the, on the backend. So it's it's a combination of both. Um, I'm just giving uh, options here, not uh, specific. Why the HP only, it doesn't matter on local storage because local storage is origin constraint. It's already if you make it on HTTPS, it's already constrained. One is one access. It's in H yeah. The, the difference is it's HP only built in. You know? Yeah, but the different the difference is if you have um, a cross site scripting vulnerability. So if somebody manages to run malicious code in your origin, mm -hmm. you can simply read your local storage and steal your JWT token. Yeah. Well, if it's in a cookie that's not accessible to JavaScript, with oh, the yeah, HTTP only yeah. flag, and you cannot really access it. You can still start making calls to the backend without restrictions, though. Yeah. Um, so the attack becomes a bit more difficult, but the, the same attack factor is still there. Um, it's just instead of stealing one token, it's actually becoming um, or making sure that you can run additional uh, code in that context and you can start making requests to do whatever you want. Yeah, I agree. Saying that the flags on the cookies, because the flags are there, it makes it more secure than local storage. The flags are only there because the cookies need to be patched. <laughs> While local storage, I mean, I'm not saying local storage is a secure way to use, but um, I mean, it's built later. They already talked a little bit about some stuff. I just rather store the most okay. critical uh, identity claims in a secure location. This is the, this is the heart of security, so. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I will no longer ask you questions in this talk. You're freaking no. brilliant. This has been amazing. <laughs> and I'll shut up now. Yeah, it's a very interesting discussion. It's pros and cons. That's always the, the story here. So, a few uh, last, last examples. So this is course. We covered that uh, already uh, based on the question. This is about WebSocket hijacking vulnerability, which is essentially CSERF for WebSocket connections. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. What I want to say here is this um, highly depends on the presence of the origin header to defend against this. And this is a vulnerability we had in, in a VNC server for, uh, for this virtualization environment. And essentially, because of this CSERF vulnerability, the attacker had full read-write access to a VNC console, meaning that they could simply take over a virtual machine if you were logged into that um, recently. So this is, uh, again, something where this security model of the browser comes into play. You need to use these protections to prevent things like this from happening. Then a couple of questions, maybe very relevant to your uh, XSS story. If you want to store secrets in the browser and you don't want to store it in cookies, you can always um, use a private origin for that. So you can um, create a, a very specific file on your website saying <laughs> secret token.example.com, load an iframe from that and store the token in there. And then you can uh, tunnel every request you want to make through there and the, only that frame has access to the token and can attach it to outgoing uh, requests. So if the main site, your main application wants to get some from the, uh, something from the API. It makes a request with map messaging to the private origin saying, make this call for me and attach a token. This one has a token in this local storage. Nothing else runs in here, so nothing else can steal the token. You can make the request uh, and send the results back to the site here um, to do that. This is a very good way to store secrets. Um, if the main site never needs to know the secret um, to perform operations, then you can actually get away with doing this. Then the second thing is um, from, from Chrome OS, how Chrome OS actually um, tackles document uh, rendering. So, of course, uh, Chrome OS is entirely browser-based, so it heavily depends on browser-based security. <coughs> but it also deals with uh, Google Docs, which is purely untrusted content. So what they do there is they actually um, have this sandboxed environment where they uh, render documents. They can execute scripts in there, but it runs in a unique origin. And then the main site is protected with this content security policy to prevent injection attacks and uh, they delegate all the sensitive operations to the sandbox iframe where they actually um, don't even care if it's compromised. Um, it simply runs in the iframe and it cannot do anything bad anyway. So, brings me to the last slide. Um, now it's up to you, um, of course, after this week, uh, because none of you is going to work probably uh, for the rest of this week. Um, but I can talk about security all day I want, but you guys build applications. You guys build applications that we use and actually need to be secure. So that's your job to do. Um, you can find more information uh, from me online. Uh, stuff is in here, the slides are online. And most importantly, if you have something to share, uh, do so. Jim has shared plenty of uh, knowledge here today. But also you guys, um, if you do something security-wise, share this. Block, uh, Dropbox did this with, with our blog post. They share uh, very good security information which you can use to build your applications in a secure way. So I encourage you to do the same. Um, you have 
local meetups in your community, go there and tell people about what you did and why you did it and yeah, help everybody make a more secure web. And the final note is if you want to know more, I have a web security course um, here in Leuven as well. So if you are interested in that, feel free to take a look and talk to me about that. You take remote students or? Um, if they fly in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, a, it's an on-site course. So, any questions? Are your brains fried from a full day of sick out there? Yeah. I didn't quite get the, uh, the, the thing that you said about the secure tunnel. How, how does that work? Because I mean, it seems to me, I, I understand how you can keep a secret in that, uh, in, in, in that uh, uh, unique origin uh, sandbox. Mm -hmm. But what is there storing a, 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 a script running in the main uh, context? No, it doesn't prevent that. So first of all, you can um, you can control what kind of calls can be made from the client side. So that's one thing. Um, it doesn't stop the script from making the call, but it prevents your token from being leaked and okay. stolen. So that, that's the main thing. Okay, but anything can use the token. Yes, yes, but it's the same thing. Once you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, anything can do, well, any script can do whatever it wants. This has, has always been the case. Um, it, it was always already the case with non-HTTP only cookies with a session identifier in there. Once you had a cross-site scripting attack, what they did is they did a session hijacking attack. They stole the identifier, shipped it off, and allowed someone else to access your Facebook, for example. Because it's a lot easier to do this one call, to steal one thing and ship it off and do whatever you want, than, than to start doing everything from within <coughs> your browser. Um, because that depends on the fact how long is your browser open, how long you stay there, and things like that. Okay, so it doesn't close the window of opportunity entirely, but it, it, it shrinks it. Well, it, it doesn't do anything against the attack factor, but it limits the harm that can be done. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thanks.